right, good morning, everyone. All right, so through perineum or through the rectum, what's the best way to uh, biopsy the prostate? I think this discussion has been going on for the past few years since the new resurgence of the perineum approach to the prostate cancer. I uh, have no disclosures uh, uh, related to this talk. So just going back in history a little bit, and um, in the past, we used to do blind biopsies. We just would fill the prostate to the transrectal examination and uh, stick a needle in there through the rectum alongside our fingers or through the perineum, essentially just seeking tissue, sampling tissue confirmation. We're just sampling the prostate. We're happy with it. Um, with the ultrasound, we start seeing the prostate. So transrectal ultrasound probe, especially the end fire probe, would allow us to now see the prostate very well. So we could hit the prostate, we could direct the biopsies to different areas of the prostate. So there was a whole new era. We developed the sextant uh, uh, sampling technique that later evolved to what we call the extended 10 to 12 core techniques, which is the, still the standard for sampling in prostate biopsy these days. And uh, it also allow us to do transperineal approach, which we, in the past, we're doing just for saturation biopsies. In those cases where we can't find cancer, there's too high suspicion, and we need to saturate biopsies to increase our sampling. So that was done to the perineal approach in the past. Um, now we have had uh, the MRI development, and now we not only can see prostate very well, but start seeing the cancer very well, very well delineated and located in the prostate. So this is allowing us to find disease that is hard to target when you're doing just a blind sampling approach from, from the rectum. For here, for example, you can see an anterior lesion. And uh, we can actually be precise and very, uh, 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 can target very well these lesions in the prostate. So this is the new chapter. We do directed and targeted biopsies. This is guided by the MRI. Uh, the in bore biopsy in, in the MRI suite has, has become a little cumbersome and difficult to do the technical issues. So the technology that allows us to fuse MRI and ultrasound brings this back to, the, to our hands and, uh, and uh, popularizes techniques. So now we can target the lesions. And, um, and now with this approach, we can do transrectal and also transperineal. So one thing I wanna just pause a little bit for a moment is the benefit of the fusion biopsy. So this is something that always needs to be present. Several studies have shown this. I'm just gonna bring one here, it's a profuse trial, probably the first trial who brought up attention to this issue. So we can do machine fusion or software fusion. You can do cognitive fusion and that both compare uh, uh, favorably against just sampling the process. So the conclusions from this trial were that the visual estimated, which we call cognitive biopsy perform better than just, just sampling. Uh, the MRI guided tend to perform best, especially uh, uh, for smaller, smaller lesions. So trying to do cognitive and smaller lesions might be challenging, uh, but either approach is better than the standard. So this is a benefit that we should never, never forget and never change our approach uh, in detriment of our losing our ability to target lesions. So when you try to tabulate the pros and cons of both approaches, transrectal versus transperineal, uh, this is what we find. The transrectal, it's uh, easy access, um, just local anesthesia block around the prostate, very familiar procedure to urologists, office-based. Um, we have a very well-established target biopsy uh, protocols using MRI and ultrasound fusion techniques and has no or minimal post-procedure pain, so very well tolerated by the patients. The cons are uh, poor access to the anterior zone, especially in the apex, so in those situations when you have tumors in those locations might be a little challenging to reach those, those areas. There's always a bleeding risk, transrectal, transurethral. Uh, the infection risk is obvious because we're going through the rectal. And also the use of antibiotic, which induces uh, bacteria resistance, include costs, uh, side effects, and allergic reactions, all the other com possible complications that come from antibiotic use. From the transparent approach, uh, provides better access to the anterior gland, uh, basically eliminates the risk of, uh, of infection, um, precludes the, the, the need for antibiotic, and also has no rectal bleeding risk. So several advantages right there. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the contra-arguments, um, 
might be more challenging for local anesthesia. A lot of people still using sedation or taking these patients in the, for the OR uh, to do these procedures. Um, equipment costs, it might require the, the, the uh, it might include costs for acquisition of a new equipment to do this. The procedure costs may be a little more elevated because of the time and anesthesia procedures. Learning curve for those urologists that uh, do not perform any perineal procedures. The risk of perineal hematoma um, and pain. So the main driver for this transperineal approach has been uh, the concerns about infection. So um, in the area of uh, antimicrobial resistance, this has actually become a, a global concern. There's several papers in all different areas uh, uh, um, trying to improve our um, uh, antibiotic stewardship and uh, utilization. Uh, there's increase in 30 days uh, post-op biopsy infection rates from 2.6 to 3.5, and this is data uh, uh, from, from New York. Uh, a lot of other data has been pub published uh, supporting these concerns about the antibiotics. So post-biopsy sepsis and the, the cost also uh, adjusted by, by inflation, you see the numbers there. Uh, the use of uh, fluoroquinolones before the biopsy will also significantly increase the risks of associated uh, incidence of prostatitis after the biopsy, the biopsy and so forth and so on. So um, you see there's a lot of evidence and a lot of concerns for, for infection and that has been the main approach. The, the, the concern and the resistance about going towards the transperineal approach would include those questions. Is cancer detection the same if you do the transperineal approach? Is it possible to keep the fusion biopsy ability and the benefits of targeting through the transperineal approach? Does it really have a better risk of infection? So if you look at the risk of infection, is about 5%, it can go all the way to 9, 10% in some series, but in some other series of aug augmented uh, uh, antibiotic prophylaxis or targeted antibiotic prophylaxis, maybe 2% or less. So how can you improve on such a small risk of infection? Um, is it more painful? during the procedure or post-procedure. Our experience with the saturation biopsies was not really good because a lot of enters in the perineum would cause perineal hematomas, so there will be a limitation for that approach. Um, the anesthesia requirements, the, the technique, is that something that uh, will create some learning curve for adoption? Can be performed in the office, or we have to go back to the OR or the outpatient center to perform, the, perform these procedures uh, 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 comfortably. Um, and, and, and additional costs with the more complicated, more cumbersome procedure. So a lot of these questions have already been addressed. So in terms of diagnostic accuracy, uh, several papers show that the, the cancer detection rate and significant cancer detection rates are the same, very similar. This is just to show a uh, meta-analysis of a large series showing that absolutely no difference in terms of a cancer detection uh, if you're going uh, uh, transperineally or transrectally. Risk of infection. Over and over and over, we see new, pa new, new papers coming up and showing large series, uh, showing that the risk of infection is virtually zero when you do transperineal uh, approach. This is just one of them, 3,000 patients. They were undergoing 12, 18, or 24 uh, needle core biopsies. And you can see here uh, that the risk of infection really doesn't, doesn't change, very, very low. Um, but when you increase the number of cores, you start having a little bit of a higher rate uh, in terms of a bleeding. Uh, of course, urethral bleeding right here, the second line in this box right here, doesn't change expectedly. Uh, but hospital admissions and uh, ED visits increase. Um, in terms of uh, ability to do in the office, can you do under local anesthesia? Yes. A lot of our techniques have been published on how to perform this, this local block. It includes a subcutaneous perineal block, periprostatic nerve block that we typically do. You can do pudendal nerve blocks. And um, for the perineal approach, the periapical triangle block is something that seems to be very significant in terms of improving the pain. And um, the majority of the, the, the protocols include the combination of all of those uh, uh, blocked approaches. Uh, more recently, instead of uh, using the grid approach when every core biopsy would require one new entry through the perineum, you do one entry on each side, right here, marked by these red dots, and there will be a port. And then through that port, you just go and rotate and sample that side, same thing on the other side. So only two enters in the perineum will make it a lot easier in terms of a, of a 
very new hematoma and pain and discomfort during the procedure, and it still allows you to sample the prostate appropriately. Um, and here, the, the, the depiction of the blocks, the relationship with the nerves, and also uh, how the biplanar um, ultrasound probe can help with that visualization. Cognitive fusion techniques has also been proven to, that that can be done with the transperineal approach, with a hand-free uh, transperineal approach. So uh, several studies also have shown that it's feasible, it is safe, cancer detection rate is also uh, similar to a historical series. So this is one of the largest of them, like at more than 12,000 cases were done by freehand transperineal under local anesthesia and um, and again, they prove the safety, and they're also uh, uh, proposing some potential cost benefits uh, 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 with that approach. So, putting back all this, now we have two randomized clinical trials. So those tend to provide more strong, definitive answers to, do, to those questions. Um, they're both published this year, so uh, the, the Mien study were, were um, published uh, earlier in the Journal of Urology, and there was a prospective randomized clinical trial when they used, um, uh, uh, they included a multi-location multi single center. So single center, five hospitals, and they included all those centers uh, with a single protocol, 763 subjects, and they randomized these patients to receive transrectal biopsy versus transperineal. The transrectal approach received augmented antibiotic prophylaxis for one day. So it's given antibiotic for one day. There's oral and also uh, a parenteral antibiotic, but no targeted prophylaxis. So they're not doing uh, rectal swabs and cultures. The, the arm receiving transperineal biopsy uh, were done completely without antibiotic and a local anesthesia only. They're not taken to the OR. So this is just to uh, show how the two protocols compare in terms of uh, 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 the preparation, the enemas, and everything else, everything pretty much, pretty much similar and comparable there. And uh, this is a quick tabulation of their infectious complications. And as you can see, there's essentially no difference in, in, in terms of the, the composite infection uh, uh, bars on your far left side, and then by each individual uh, uh, item sepsis, fever, uh, uh, need for additional antibiotics, prostatitis, epididymorchide, and so forth, so on. So absolutely no, no difference there. And if you look at the tabulated results, uh, same thing. Um, interestingly, the infection rate in this series was not zero in the transperineal approach. And a lot of other series, they put zero, zero. They have no, uh, uh, um, no, no event. Here they had, but no, no difference to the transrectal. This is uh, the near one. It was a prospective randomized clinical trial as well, but multi-center. They use a, a uniform, a uniform protocol, 658 subjects, and uh, they were uh, randomized to uh, between transrectal and transperineal. The difference here is the antibiotic prophylaxis in the transrectal group. So these patients they had rectal swabs, and they're giving. Uh, uh, targeted um, prophylaxis. Uh, the transperineal, same thing, without prophylaxis um, done in the office under local anesthesia. So um, this is uh, the, the adverse events uh, table showing the comparison how the infection, you can see the, there's a little bit of a higher infection rate on the transrectal group, but that, that was not statistically significant. Um, if you look at the rates of urinary retention and bleeding complications, they're not statistically different. In terms of uh, cancer detection, again, no difference. Seems that both approaches can, can detect cancer uh, equally, both low-risk cancers and also significant cancers. That's why they, they divided between uh, grade group one and grade group two to five. This table shows the biopsy pain scores. And um, you see a little trend towards the transperineal. They have a score of a 3.6 versus transrectal 3.0. That was statistically significant, so transperineal more painful. Is that difference, the 0.6 difference in the score, clinically significant? Probably not. Um, and But they look at the biopsy pain seven days out, there was no difference, meaning it was mostly acute during the procedure, but nothing that was durable afterwards. 
um, and the rest of the complications are all the same. So based on that paper, can we, can we say that one approach is better than the other? I think uh, depending on what you like, you can twist the, the argument favoring one or favoring the other. But uh, uh, when you look critically what's the best for your practice, just, just be critical to what is you know, best, uh, uh, best suiting your needs. So transrectal, it's convenient, it's cheaper, it's a quick procedure, we all know how to do this very easily. It's office-based and probably less painful for the patients. For the transperineal, there's no or minimal risk of infection. You don't need antibiotic. There's no risk of a rectal ble bleeding. And more and more, we're getting more comfortable with the anesthesia protocols, and that this can be done uh, uh, in, in the office. So um, what are the considerations about this? I think uh, developing tools for uh, the infection risk assessment is something that will be important. Um, probably we're in a phase right now that um, we shouldn't do all, all cases transperineally and all cases transrectal. I think there's probably some risk stratification there. Um, for, the, for, for example, in the transrectal approach, there's ways to, to mitigate the risk. So apparently the use of rectal swabs and more directed antibiotic prophylaxis seems to be a better uh, uh, use of, of antibiotics. Um, a lot of our protocols, a lot of centers are using augmented antibiotic prophylaxis with a very low rates of infection, but that has a cost. You're using more fluoroquinolones, you're inducing more resistance, you're using two antibiotics. There's cross resistance between sulfas and also the fluoroquinolones. So there's consequences to that, to that practice and, uh, and uh, there's probably better ways to do this. Uh, groups that are at risk for infections, for example, as being described before, uh, patients with previous biopsies, patients who had fluoroquinolones uh, uh, in less than six months before the biopsy, Asians, patients with diabetes, obesity, all those patients are at higher risk of having infections. So those might be the ones that would be more careful in terms of antibiotic prophylaxis or even transitioning completely to a transperineal approach. Um, in terms of the transperineal, again, I think safety has been established, uh, uh, cancer detection established. The, the hurdle that seems to, to, to limit most people in most practices is just the workflow. How they do this in the office? Can they do the, the anesthesia appropriately? The, these patients need to go to the OR. Do we have to take them for sedation? Can we do this as quick and as expeditiously as we do the, the, the transrectal? So those are all things that have uh, progressively improved over time. Uh, the other things I want to say, uh, the MRI continues to develop. Our ability to see and localize and target lesions is something that continues to be utilized. I think the integration of molecular markers, genomics, genetic markers with imaging, I didn't mention anything because of the, the time here in terms of that selection, but it's probably where the field needs to go to allow us to avoid the necessary biopsies, first of all, um, eliminate the sampling, because right now we target and that we direct extra course to the lesions that we can see and identify, but we still need to sample the whole prostate. MRI is still not good enough to say, okay, where we don't see anything, you don't have to biopsy because it's absolutely negative. We don't have that high pre negative predictive value yet. So sampling is still needed. Um, but hopefully we're gonna get to the point where we don't have to sample anymore. You just go to the target, direct some course there, and then you have your answer. Uh, and I think the, the MRI ultrasound fusion, the software fusion is the key component here. If you transition to the perineal approach, hand, uh, 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 free hand, but you're not fusing, you might be helping in terms of the infection risk, but you're losing the benefit of targeting, you're going back in history. So you should keep the benefits and always add the new, the new features. Uh, so again, Going back to our history and how we progress in terms of how we've been biopsying the prostate, maybe we're gonna move towards directing the new chapter there at the bottom, the bottom uh, um, where we can see the lesions, we can direct the biopsies only to those lesions, we don't sample the whole prostate, that way one single entry or two in the perineum we can get targeted very precisely, no antibiotics, less risk of infection and bleeding, and then you have your answer. Thank you very much for your time.